So how does it feel like looking at sickle cell from a secondary lens? And I'm asking this question because I've actually never asked my sisters and how they have felt, you know, growing up and just watching, watching me in pain. Because I have a sister actually that has sickle cell disease. So it was like a double dose for my other two sisters and my parents. Uh -huh. So... I've never really had a conversation with them talking about, oh, how is it watching? How did you feel having to experience that from that secondary lens? Like, how did it feel? So I really want to know your answer about this. Like, how did it feel watching that whole thing play out? Especially in a serious crisis. You know, that kind of crisis yeah. where your chest is spinning, your hand is spinning you, yeah. you can't sit, you can't lie down, you can't move, like everything is just yeah. in pain. Like that kind of, like, how did you feel? In that moment, it's just we are all in solution mode. Mm. How can we help? What can be done? Medication. You see, as we're all calculating, this mm. is one person is handling the leg, one person because single therapy you can switch like this. Mm. This <laughs> if, if we in this minute that massage you're doing for the arm is helpful. In two minutes later, I beg leave my hand. Honestly. Wow, you yes. hit that nail on the head. <laughs> the yes. same thing that was sitting. So we have to just be sharp, like so. We're all we're all perceptive. Is this still mm -hmm. helping? Should we do this? Do mm -hmm. you want this drink? At the same time, trying to keep you drinking. Do you get so in the moment? It's not like it's just like solution mode, solution mode. Like how can we help? What can we do better? Okay, should we start going to the hospital? Is it time when we go to the hospital? Let's make sure the doctor is around. Which one kind mm -hmm. of? And then, I think with my experience with this is that maybe it's conversations like this that make me think of it. But after it, it's just full of joy that, okay, crisis is over. Mm. My kid, she's laughing, mm. she's walking, she's good. She mm. can go back to school, she's healthy. And like, we're all in normal. Before we know, we're ever arguing about who should be what she Like, you get it? It was very, that's why I say my, I, I can't say my childhood was so mad. It was just okay. When to pay all of us, all hands on dead people, we can do them. After, we're just so happy that, ah, she's good now. And those days, whenever my sister's ill and she's now better, my daddy will buy how many Barbies before we know we're begging her. <laughs> the Barbie yeah. bribe. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that kind of thing. So it was very, it's now that I look back at it and I just feel like, especially because it's family, like, mm -hmm. even if it wasn't sickle pain, what, whatever ailment it was. Yeah, like, exactly, family, yeah. It's mm -hmm. for them to get better. Yes. when they're better, you're happy they're better. I, yeah, that was basically it. Definitely. Like, that just really, you know, sums it up. And sort of give me an in, gives me an insight of how someone looking at yeah. it from a different lens would see, would see how, just how the process goes. And, you know, with sickle cell, and I know that right now in this time and age, like, things are getting better, but there's still a lot of discrimination and just that whole nastiness surrounding it. How do you react to those sort of like discrimination? Like how do you feel about when sick cell patients are being discriminated? And have you ever been in a situation where someone spoke a certain way about sickle cell? Like have you ever been uh -huh. in that situation? How did you feel yeah. about it? Like uh -huh. hmm. I'm not even with me, I'm not like your typical, overly argumentative, <laughs> single same type of person. I'm a listener. I, you know, I'm more of like an introvert type of person. Yeah. There are certain topics that, you know, make you hear my voice. So when people are like, I don't know what is speaking false nonsense <laughs> about sickle cell patients and how they live their life. Mm -hmm. and, I am the first to say, like, don't say that. My own family member is fine, like, doing well, mm -hmm. looking beautiful, looking hot. My friend looks hot. Mm -hmm. Don't come and say any kind of thing. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. I have family members that are, are in their 60s, 70s, like, you know, thriving and doing well. And God has been with them and will continue to be with them. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's annoying. That one I'll say is annoying and it gets me obsessed. I try to re-educate mm -hmm. and re but then I've also come to learn that some people like to stay in their ignorance. Yes. And some people enjoy to stay in whatever narratives they want to build around sickle cell. And that mm -hmm. is your own piece. Just know that you can't say that narrative around me. But I will re-educate you if you choose to continue <laughs> to it. I, I won't say all those, especially like who should marry who, or like I'm married, no, I don't want to marry. But I just say 
anyone you marry can have any health condition or develop any health mm-hmm. but you know like i say some people like to stay in there it's their choice it's just that is one thing where you know like it's not everything you have to show your view and you know fight I can't be silent so that's mm-hmm. just, i just can't I have to say something mm-hmm. you how do you deal with this you like have like actually if do you always say something or how do you handle it uh, for me, I don't think, I don't necessarily say anything. I just listen. And I don't know if that's so much of a good thing, but because of the fact that for me, when it comes to talking about sickle cell and dwelling on it, like actually having deep conversation and going to, you know, have a conversation with someone that thinks that way, I can get really emotional. On a normal day, I'm an emotional person. Yeah. So for me to put myself in that, I'll probably just even start crying halfway, halfway through the conversation. But so I don't really engage in those conversations. And what I do is that I just sort of like listen and sort of like understand the, what the person is saying. You get it's just you know people have their own different look on things, and sometimes it's not always the best look. If someone is willing to change, because you know that there are some people that. They have this certain view just because they do not have enough information. That's why it's like that. But in a case where someone has the information and is not willing to even think differently, then those are even situations where I don't even see a reason wasting my brain. Like, I don't see a reason wasting my saliva. Like, I don't see it at all. The funny thing is, like, you hear these conversations from doctors. Like, you hear this conversation from medical yeah. doctors, people that should have more knowledge on how all of this goes. Like, I've been in a situation where... A group of people were having a conversation about sickle cell. I think there was a sickle cell patient around and a group of people were having a conversation. And, you know, they're just talking about just like what you say, like, oh, no, like my brother can't bring a sickle cell patient to the house. So sh- I won't stand for it, this and that, like what kind of thing is that? And they're just saying all sorts of nasty things. So like nasty, nasty things that you can't even imagine the things that they've said. But even at that, hearing that, that's not even the worst that I've said or the worst that someone has even directly told me. You get so I don't know, I don't really deal with those things. I just let them slide because I don't think I have the the strength to deal with that. So I just in my way find a different way to educate people and pass my message. You get but it's so sad the ignorance that still exists. Very sad how ignorant people are with secret yeah. and just all of those things like what do you mean that you can't let your brother marry someone? And first of all, who even says they want to marry your brother? <laughs> Nobody's checking your brother out. Please sit down. <laughs> like, ah, uh-uh. sure. Like, who says you want to marry your brother? You just feel like, oh, your brother is that. What of personality? Is, does your brother even have a good personality? Is it just about, oh, he's AA or whatever it is that his genotype is? It doesn't make any sense now. Like, why you are there raising your brother so high and you're stepping down on somebody just because of something that they had no choice over. Like, you came into this yeah. world and this was given to you. That was something that you had to take. Whether you liked it or not, like, you just had to carry it and go about your day and live your life. And now you're not pushing the person down. Like, the person doesn't even have enough. You get so I don't engage you. I really, 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 really don't engage. I don't engage at all. And so with your experience now, like well, how would you react to someone coming to you? And I, I'm asking this first um, question in I want to hear your personal view and your medical view. How do you react to someone coming to you and being like, Oh, AS and I want to marry, you know, this guy or this girl or whatever and also AS? Like how would you react to that situation? A lot of the time, these things happen because of lack of education mm. and lack of knowledge. So I used to be really emotional with it. Like, how could you? How can you even yeah. think about it? But, you know, I've come down. I've now come to understand that, you know, they just need to know and need to understand. Like, now I'm very passionate about, you know, having those conversations with them and letting them know. And also, like, in that moment, I was going to be true, like, it's not, it's, this is not wise. Medically, mm-hmm. even like for your relationship, it is not because this thing you're doing, there's a huge aspect of it that is selfish because you're not the one that's going to suffer. Mm-hmm. Primarily, it's innocent child that might have to, you know, go through this. So think on it. Like as a medical professional, you can never force it. You can just give them the facts of the situation. But my thing now, 
it's even getting to people before they fall deeply. You know how when you first start talking to a guy, you have to be a bit casual. You cannot come and be yeah. <laughs> How many kids you want. <laughs> but I say people that are AS, you have that freedom mm. you have from the first date. You are allowed. What is your gen- <laughs> like? You What's your, your genotype? Well, let's just know now. What's your genotype can be as casual as a hey, who? What do you like eating? Mm. We don't have to wait till you, okay. We become a bit deep with each other. Yeah. To protect yourself and to protect your emotions. Like once you have your AS, that is end. Like as early as first meeting that's now my parole of like what i advise people like if you're a that's it and you are allowed it's not too much if you run away because you asked that he would have run away anyway he would have <laughs> run away so go ahead and those that i am really i've always said i'm not for it i'm really not for it i don't support it i feel like i don't support it but i can imagine how hard it is because i've actually had close friends and family members who have had to like break up with what because of this issue. I empathize with them and I respect them a whole lot because I've all been in love. We know how love love conquers all, but this is one of those things that I feel like the like, people that have had the strength to do it, I really respect them because it's not easy. And that's why I'm really preaching before it has gotten to the stage where he's the love of your life. When he's just this casual guy you met or she's just this casual girl you met, if you have that genotype, ask immediately. I feel like genotype is definitely something that you should know about. That like you should know your blood group and you should know your genotype. Yeah. It's surprised how many people don't even know what a blood group is. Mm-hmm. Like those are two information that you should know. Say, ask the other person. You say, do you even know your own? Mm-hmm. 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 Like you have to know your blood group and your genotype. Even in case of emergency, like blood group is very important for you to know now. Like, come on. There are just certain things that you should know about. And for me, like I was asked this question in an interview, a medical interview, and they had asked me about a couple that wanted to although they said me I was anxious emotionally, but I don't know if I was. I'm not going to argue I'm not going to argue that I was in but I don't know if I was. But for me personally, if someone comes to talk to me and just wants to marry someone that is AS, ah, uh, the thing is just about before you go into something, like know what you're going into personally it's i would tell you it's not bliss for the whole family it's not bliss and for this child that you're going to bring into this world it is not bliss yes you can tell uh-huh. patient go about and do amazing things and they live a long and full life yes that happens but life has its own stress already so why would you not bring somebody into a life like it's already like someone yes they bring someone into a life and just giving them one heavy luggage to carry into this life it's very selfish for you to do that but also medically because of medical advancement there are so many ways that you can do that i'm not in support of the ways but you know as a doctor like if someone asks for that like you have to provide like those information you don't have to necessarily be the one that does it but you give the information regardless so and that's what i say you have to yeah, they, medically you just have to give them all the help mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah you definitely yeah. have to do them i just remember now how i like that guy you're now finding out that oh this guy <laughs> we are not like we are so not compatible there's even no way no, no way, way. Like, chai that's in just pain me shabo <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. it was it, we got over it at the end of the day, but yeah, like they, no. there's no even way. Have, that has me to <laughs> you know, you said you feel I'm like ah uh, ah, uh, and it was chai. It hits me, Shabo. It was you know because is it a s couple a s couple? Okay, you have a one in four chances of having okay. a sickle cell patient in each pregnancy, but yeah. then for this kind match, how many chances is that one? <laughs> Ah, goodness. I was so sad about that. But it's just, you know, it's just one of those things and you move on from it and to get to that. And it. honestly, these kind of things is what makes me think, like, I don't know, everyone has their religious backing and everything. But, like, going through, as as a patient, you can talk about it as a patient and even as a family, having God has always been so important yes. because... Like this way, it's like ah, you love someone or you really like someone and you can't be because of your gender type. But how are you supposed to? Like, isn't only God that can comfort that kind of pain? When the getting to know you stage was so sweet. Like, yeah. ah, ah, fine. Mm-hmm. That getting to know and you stage was. You have to say, God knows what you're doing. Yeah. Knows, like, uh, because if not for God, like, how else will you make sense of it? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, this conversation is just bringing back memories there. Eh? We hold. <laughs> <laughs> if you stay focused. <laughs> but just bring back memories of how that whole experience just played it out. Was, mm-hmm. yeah. And it was so nice because, like, you know, people, everybody just sort of saw it at that time. Yeah, yeah. it was so, like, it was like a match made in heaven. Hmm, but it wasn't imagining <laughs> was it wasn't but like you said faith is very very like your faith is very i mean my faith has helped me in times where it was so difficult and you can't really talk to anyone like you just kneel down and sometimes you can't even talk you just notice that all you're doing is crying and crying and crying when all of that like when you finish crying when you like you're on your knees you're crying when that whole thing is over like you just feel better. You don't know what it yeah. is, but there's like this better feeling that oh things are gonna be fine, like things are going to be uh-huh. okay, like you're going to, you know, it's it's gonna get better, like it's gonna get better. Yeah. And, and my faith for me has really, really helped me. And a particular passage for me, I like I like certain passages in the Bible, but I think one of my one of my favorite passages is Jeremiah 29, 11. Like, always gets it through for me. It always just gets it through for me. Because sometimes you're just like, why? Like, why? Like, why? What did I do exactly? Like, uh-huh. what did I do? And there's no answer to it. But you just you just hold on to that, to Christ. Uh, and hold yeah. on to that, to your faith. And you just keep on trusting. And, you know, it gets better. It really does get better. So now in this COVID period, like thank God we are sort of coming out of it, or at least it's better than how it started. And in this COVID period, I know that it would be particularly hard, you know, having to worry about not just COVID, but having to worry about COVID and sickle cell. Because I would imagine that combination would be, you know, can really go a certain way. So how did you deal with that, like having to worry so much about just everything that was going on. Yeah. I think, like me, when it comes to worry, there are two things I like to bank on. First of all, God, I guess God. And second of all, I like, okay, what can we do? Like, so as a family, we came together and we thank God for, like, God allowing that opportunity for, you know, someone being able to be with my family member where she actually yeah, was in yeah. the way that she did not have to move outside the house mm-hmm. throughout the thick of that period like mm-hmm. food was taken care of everything so like we thank god that that was an enablement she was not by herself yeah someone was with her throughout and every, took all the precautions my mom was one of those moms yeah onion, boy, oh my yeah. goodness that on your team oh. <laughs> like she did them all and like not that it, but like it was just <laughs> i think my fear would have been at the top most if maybe my family member was alone. And even like people that matter to me, like you, you had a support system at that time too. Mm. You were with your family and everything. So that gave me a certain level of peace that everyone I knew that, you know, had was a patient time, they had a support system mm. around them, which I think is so helpful mm-hmm. if you understand moments like that. So I think I mean, you have these occasional moments, but that's why we just spoke about faith and how faith is yeah, so helpful. Yeah. You know, having God to go Yeah, to. God just shows up in those points. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. You yourself, like you being, do you ever have fears for like yourself personally, like how this COVID thing? Like I had fears for myself and I had fears for my family because I cannot just imagine... Like, I had fears in that, oh, I don't want this to happen to any of my family members because I'll honestly be a mess. And then I had fears of, I don't want this to happen to me because my family would be a mess. Like, they can't, like, I can't, I I don't want to imagine putting, I don't want to imagine them having to go through that. Because the thing is that you just don't know how your body will react to things. Do you understand? Like, like in COVID now, it hits people differently. Some people had it bad. Some people had it, you know, just had like a mild symptom and they were fine. Uh-huh. But some people had it really bad as well. And some people, you know, like they just had the other end of it. So you don't really know. And just to think about that, and it was quite worrying for me. But thankfully, God works in mysterious ways. Like I didn't really have to be out. And these yeah. certain things just happened in that point that. Not that I necessarily liked it, but it was yeah. it was definitely for my good. 
So that's more my good and, mm, and then it gave I feel as though it gave my family peace to know that yeah. um, I wasn't having to be exposed to those things. So it definitely gave them peace and just God and faith really just helped to make that whole process and that whole time a bit more made it easier. So in your life now, like or just you know in general, is there any defining moment for you or in your career, any defining moment that has changed the way you've you've thought about things or the way that you look at things? Like not just pertaining to sickle cell, it could be anything really. Defining I feel well, in my much younger years, mm. I wanted to be related to because we were abroad and my sister got ill and, you know, at that time, we had, like, a much younger sister, like, she was still a baby. Yeah. And mom couldn't go with my dad. We were, like, a foreign country that we'd never been before. Mm-hmm. My mom couldn't go with my dad to the hospital. And, you know, everyone was crying because my sister was really in deep pain. Yeah. And we were some didn't know the health system. So I remember that time, I mean, my dad jumped into the car, put my sister in the back and was about to drive off because, I mean, I was, like, nine. Mm-hmm. Not like I'm old. Mm-hmm. And I just remember, like, running after the car and banging on it. I just entered. Yeah. I was wearing anything useful, wearing, wearing shoes. Mm-hmm. And I know this, it doesn't sound very, you know, dramatic, but it, it changed a lot in my life because we went yeah. to hospital. And that was the first time, like, it was in a more developed country than Nigeria. So, yeah. that, you know, all pain medications where you can just press. Yeah, the you know, the, um, patient you control and the yeah, yeah, how they just handled her. And when we came, I was already in tears. My daddy was frazzled. And the doctor just looked me in the eye and said, we've got, got her. You know, it's going to be good. Don't mm-hmm. cry. Like, the doctor already, like, encouraged my sister. But then he now came and encouraged me. Mm-hmm. And encouraged me. But he saw a family in shambles. Yeah. Like, we didn't know what to do. And that changed my life in the sense of medicine and, you know, the kind of doctor I wanted to be and all those kind of things. But it was yeah. just, it, it was a bit too today. See, my voice already... Yeah, it, even me, like, I'm having it. goodbumps and yeah, so it's getting yeah, a bit yeah, emotional. Like, as small as it sounds, my entire time in St. Nicholas, through the good and the yeah. bad, and seeing, meeting the people I met, colleagues like you, and even, like, doctors, like the clinical director of St. Nicholas and everything, a model type of person I want to be in this profession and the type of doctor I want to be, a type of human I still yeah. want to be, and mm-hmm. the type of doctors that were able to have a full life, a full family life at the same time still be so good at their profession. Yeah. I didn't know St. Nicholas had so much of an effect on me until after now I'm no longer yeah. there. Yeah. really feel like it's happening. It has shown me pictorially the type of doctor and the type of life I want to have. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those are still Mm. very professional wise. I mean, they're all these personal, personal experiences. Heartbreak, you go through that. (laughs) But yeah. (laughs) Heartbreak can just give you one kind of shock in this life. (laughs) We just rearrange you somehow. Yeah. So that story, so was that the exact moment that you knew that you went to be a doctor? Yeah, definitely. That day at nine years old, it was sure. And before then, I still the same as but then it became like so sure, like for sure, for sure. Like the way that doctor, like the way he was, like we've got her, like we've got her. Like don't worry. He's just I'm so nice doctor. when you meet doctors like that. When you meet doctors like that, and because when doctors are perceptive to your pain or your distress, yes. Like, that is definitely um, like the type of doctor I want to be. Someone that is present, yes, and yes. it's just not about prescribing medication and you know examinations and things. Like be a human being, be present, yes. not just act on oh this is that. Like not act in a robotic way, but actually have mm-hmm. feelings and be 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 present and be a human being. Like honestly, that story was just just mm-hmm. really. That's it's so big like you know at a point I was applying to uni in America yeah that was college essay mm-hmm. like my own college is that was that story so. mm-hmm. you've told me this story before but now even just hearing you saying it again like, it was still emotional it was very mm-hmm. emotional for me to hear it again honestly yeah. wow mm-hmm. what oh. about you this which what thing that changed your life completely Oh my goodness, thing that changed my life completely. Oh, I've had a couple of experiences, like life-changing experiences, but 
one of it for me, what period was this now? I think it was during, after MDC and I was on a plane. I was either going back to, you know, worry or I was going to Lagos. And I was going to Lagos. I had an interview and I was going to Lagos. And we're on the plane and we are just sort of taking off maybe like 20 minutes after. And they now announced, is a doctor on board? And me, me, I'm like, I, I'll ask myself, am I a doctor like this? Because, you know, this medicine thing is so weird. Because sometimes you don't really feel like it. I was like, nah, I can't be a doctor like this. So because, <laughs> what have I done? Because <laughs> yeah, that was quite early on in this whole medicine thing. I'm like, what have I done? What was it that I know that I want to do here now? I just kept quiet. So I sat down. I said, okay, now let's be watching. Maybe if nobody show up, I can ask them what happened. Like, how can I help and things like that. And... Okay, so a guy had come up, he had presented some ID or whatever it is. It was a girl, she was quite young. Maybe I'll place her around maybe 16, 15, but she was actually quite young. And, you know, she had this backpack and she was in crisis. So she was a sickle cell patient and she was in crisis. Like she was in so bad of a crisis. And the guy, the doctor had just come and he had, I don't know what he even did. I think he spoke to her, did some things. They opened her bag and I don't know whether they were looking for drug or something, something like that, but I don't know what happened. And then he went back to his seat. And this girl was like, you know how it is to just be in pain in a confined space. I was looking at her because I was sitting, I think I was sitting a bit behind her on the other side, like adjacent. And I was looking at her and I, I just could not do anything. So I asked the person that was sitting close to her, because that one obviously did not know what to do. He was just there. I'm sure he was like, ah, which kind which kind of thing is this? And I'm like, what's going on? So I asked him to switch with me and he switched and I sat down with her and I just held her hand. I was like, you know what, you're going to be fine. Like, just take deep breaths. Because right now, you know, the oxygen tension is low and all of that. So you need to actually take deep breaths to help. And I asked the aerostats, I'm like, I need a big bottle of water. And I gave it to her. I'm like, you need to drink this. Like, you need to drink this as much as you can. And you need to keep taking deep breaths. So we had checked to see if she had any medication. She had taken that. And so I held her hand. I'm like, just take deep breath. Like, just keep going. You're going to be fine and all of that. And this whole experience happened in air. And so we now finally caught to Lagos. And you know, they tried to get an ambulance to take a ha and all of those things. And she had gone and waited. And people were just like, oh, like, thank you for what you did. That was so nice. But I think, I think really, it was a very life-changing moment for me because I think that was the point for me where I realized what I was supposed to do with sickle cell. Oh my goodness, I'm tearing up. Okay. And before then, I just kept on, I've been trying to you know, move forward with this, trying to yeah. handle things better. But that moment was just different. Yeah. And I remember I sent a message to my mom and like all these years of praying and just being like, oh, oh, why am I crying? Okay. <laughs> so I was like all these years of praying and just asking God to perform a miracle because we know that he can do it. And yeah. he didn't do it. I think I've seen why he did not do it. Because sometimes things happen in life and everybody says, oh, things happen for a reason, this and that and whatnot. But you don't always know the reason why it happens. Sometimes you never know what that reason is. But I felt in that moment that that was the reason. That's why I like this scripture, Jeremiah, because around that period, that scripture came to mind. And I was like, and I was just yeah. like, oh my goodness, like, yeah. wow. And you know how you just feel something? And I just felt it. I'm like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like, I'm supposed to be doing this. Because at that moment, it wasn't my medical degree that helped me. It wasn't yeah. medicine. There was a doctor there. Like, that girl didn't feel better by talking to that, that doctor. It's not like... Because... You had gone through that. Exactly. Yeah. And it's not as if he could do anything more. Because in reality, what else could he have done? So it's not necessarily his fault. If I had used medicine, I probably would not have done much for her. But using that experience that I've had and what I have been through and just really relieving the moments where I have my sisters and my mom with me and everybody's just like, 
if you take a deep breath, like my mom will bring this water and she's like, you need to finish it. You need, because this is home remedy crisis management. So yeah. yeah. And like, you need to finish it. You need to keep drinking. You need to keep drinking. And I was able to be that person for her, yeah. especially in an environment where she couldn't even get off. Like, where how many feet up in the air? Like, she couldn't get off. So I can't even imagine having a crisis where I can't sit, I can't stand, I can't lie down, I can't do anything. And you have to sit down because you can't be standing in the plane now. So it was a defining moment for me and it was what, you know, sort of made things highlighted for me. And, you know, it made me more... The day Little Cell of Mind Foundation was born. <laughs> and it was born a few years after that, but it was like, that was it for me. It was me. conceived. Yes, you know, it, yeah, conceived. exactly. Because I knew that I had to do some, like, I cannot just sit down and say, I don't want to talk about this. I don't want to even acknowledge it. Because in as much as, okay, I was getting better, I had not even still gone to that point where I was sort of like acknowledging it. Because that was yeah. even before house job. I barely acknowledged things in house job. Do you get like how internship yeah. and all of that? So for me, that moment started the whole proper progress and I just keep, kept on going. I think after that, I was able to write, you know, like I don't know how many years after that, but moving on from that, I was able to write my first article where I did not write in from a different person's point of view. I actually wrote it as me. And that was yeah. a huge moment for me as well. And you know, just just having that. And now I call it standing in the sun. Most likely be the name of if I ever write a book, that would be the name of what yeah. that book is. I call it, your moment came out into the sun and you enjoyed Yeah, I, I, I stood in the sun. Yeah. That that moment was like standing in the sun for me because under the sun nothing is hidden. Like you don't really the sun doesn't care. Like it doesn't care where you're hiding, it's gonna expose everything. So that's what it was for me and that is one one of the most defining moments for me was just having to experience that. And I'm honestly grateful that for that experience because the thing is that this girl would probably just think about, oh, how this person helps me, but she would not even realize how much she helps me as well. Yeah. yeah. That would be, if I'm to pick one, that would be the one that was most for me, yeah. Oh, wow. That was like an emotional conversation. Ah, goodness. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness, I'm such like I'll just tear when I punch or this is why I don't have conversation about experiences when constantly like because I don't want to cry. I know that I'm going to cry. Like I know it. I know I'll just start tearing up. So you know, like yeah, so wow, this conversation has really been amazing, 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 amazing. And I'm just really glad that I was able to do this with you because and it, it came yeah, how we were so nervous and now it's like coming yeah. back and it's like it was so natural yeah so like just getting into that feeling and just having a conversation as friends and you know just yeah from that and the funny thing is that when this whole thing came to me and I was like when I knew that I had to have you on the podcast and have a conversation with you I think we we're having a conversation about something and you know, just yeah. sort of ventured into different things and I said yeah, like, that's our favorite pastime to enter deep, <laughs> deep from like random things. So that was it. It's just really nice to have this. Because I feel like people hearing this like obviously someone and not obviously but like I hope that somebody that's heard this it will make them feel a bit better about the things that they are going through and sort of know that they are not alone. You know, they can always reach out. Like, for me, my foundation is always open and it's open to both sickle cell patients. It's open to their loved ones because that's just what I'm trying to do is to make the lives better. That's it. That's the general yeah. purpose. That's the aim. That's it. Like, we provide therapy sessions and... We do all of those things, things that we can do to help as much as, as many people as we can help. And even if we just help one person, like that's still a win for me. Yeah, it's still a win for me. And I hope that this whole conversation that we've had, people that can relate to it or not even relate yeah, to it. Yeah, like, just feel seen. Yeah, feel, feel like seen, feel heard, feel like, like mm -hmm, that you are not alone. And for mm -hmm. those that haven't had like an experience, just be educated, like educate yourself more and you know, yeah. like just improve, improve yourself as a person, as a human being. And it doesn't yeah. even have to pertain to sickle cell, like just generally improve yourself, be a nicer person and yeah. 
Yeah. So, yeah. At this point, Ivica is going to plug in her Instagram handle for me to sell up my foundation. I mean, <laughs> to get involved or, you know, join the support group or whatever it is. You know how to carry IV. Yes, so what's the handle? <laughs> <laughs> what's the handle I, I think it's little cell of mine I think that's what the handle is I honestly don't know like, yes it's, 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 I know for sure it's little cell of mine Abby yeah, yeah. I think it's little cell L-C-O-M underscore foundation oh that's what it is oh yeah L-C-O-M so L-C-O-M underscore foundation that's what it is on Instagram and probably send me an email but always my email is open is J Joan Self. So it's like Joseph, but like the J is at the beginning and then you have Joan and then you have the completion of the Joseph. So it's J Joan Self at gmail.com. You can always send me an email and, you know, reach out. So I think we've come to the end of this episode it was such i feel so good after having this conversation such a nice conversation Mm -hmm. yeah so um i hope that you have learned something or you know even if you didn't learn anything like just take a page off experiences and be better and know that you're not alone for those who are dealing with even if it's not just sickle cell like anything it could be any form of disease like for those who are dealing with that I hope that you know that you're not alone and I hope that you feel better. And I hope that you continue to tune in to more episodes of Beyond the Genetics. Bye! Okay, bye everyone. Bye! Bye!